not replaced with options, then those can be uh, filled in with easy tests, popular configurations, whatever. These are the tester's choice cells. Obviously, they have to take on some value. The value they take on is entirely up to you. Okay, let's consider an example. This is a real-world example, I'm doing compatibility testing of the rbcs-us.com website. Let's suppose that we want to do some compatibility testing. We want to look at connection speeds, dial-up, and broadband. We'll look at four operating systems, Mac, Linux, Windows XP, and Windows Vista. We want to look at four security uh, options. Operating system only, Symantec, Trend Micro, and McAfee. And we want to look at three browser options, Firefox, Internet Explorer, and Opera. Okay, So you see there are four factors there, connection speed, operating system, security, and browser. So we need four columns. Operating system and security each have four options. So therefore, we need four numbers per column. And 4 times 4 is 16, so we would have to have at least 16 rows. All right, so here you see middle, the orthogonal array that I found and downloaded off of the AT&T website. And here on the right-hand side, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'm going to drink the water here. Um, here you see the, ortho, the uh, mapping of the testing problem shown on the previous slide onto this um, particular orthogonal array. So some of you are probably thinking, explain please how exactly this worked. Indeed, happy to do it. Okay, I got one column, two columns, three columns, four columns, so guess what? Column number five here we just delete. Right, so we could delete it. Spare column. Zero, one, two, three. So we got four options. All right, four numbers there. It's four is the number of options for operating system and security. So that's cool. We got that handled. Okay. So I call this the speed column. All right. First, I insert a column, or excuse me, insert a row up at the top, and I put these names here, speed, OS, security, and browser up on the top of each column. See what happened there. First column, basically every place there's a zero, I put a DU. You can see here, so control H, search and replace there, right, or and then we got uh, um, all the places where there's a one. We've got the BB broadband. Two and three correspond to no particular option, so I replace those with a tilde, which indicates tester choice. Do what you want. Now the next column, you see, I got a one here. So the one that's a Mac. There's another one down here, and that's a Mac, and a one, it's a Mac, and another one, and it's also there. So it's just a matter of simply going through, search and replace, like I said, um, and if you're done there, you've got this nice looking orthogonal array here. And by the way, I misspoke there when I was talking about the operating system. I actually meant that the zeros got replaced by Mac. Making sure you guys were paying attention, and I'm sure you all were. Yes, the zeros are the max. Okay. So simple search and replace. And I end up with this nice looking orthogonal array, as I said. Okay. Right. So few of these tilde things here, but uh, these are all important combinations. None of them can actually be deleted. There's no place else where I have XP with Symantec, for example. Okay.
So very straightforward. Now, of course, with the pairwise tool, it's even more straightforward than that. You're basically just going to download the tool. You're going to follow whatever directions come with the tool and explain how to use the tool and <clears throat> map the uh, factors and options in that way, and then it's going to automatically generate the um, generate that uh, pairwise table for you, and you're just going to go through and cover it with tests. So what we've got here in this webinar, the use of pairwise testing techniques to test supposedly inter independent options that might in interact in some inappropriate way or constrain each other in some inappropriate way. So we're looking for interaction that we don't like. That's the whole point. Uh, previous webinars like decision tables, state-based methods, use cases, we were looking at uh, business logic, testing of business logic, and uh, now we've added to that the ability of doing combinational testing in a manageable way, a way that we can uh, explain to people and justify in terms of its manageability, as it were. So these advanced techniques are going to uh, make you able to cover a wide range of problems now. You've got uh, the ability to test with boundary values and equivalence partitioning for uh, broad testing and for input values and those sort of things. And now you've got business logic tools with decision tables and state-based methods and use cases. And now you've got a combinational set of tools with orthogonal arrays and pairwise testing. So nice broad uh, set of testing tools available to you there to use in various situations. So that concludes the presentation proper. As always, I will put the uh, advertisement up while I uh, take questions. Uh, happy to answer any questions that people might have. Um, Again, submit your questions if you have not already via the question window in your handy uh, go to webinar interface. Um, a few questions via uh, email came in. Um, first question is one that uh, has come up in the context of advanced techniques before, which is, would you expect people to use this and other advanced techniques exactly as described here? So as I've said previously on the other advanced techniques, yes, the, the examples are realistic and they are immediately applicable. You can see that that was the case with the example that we worked through. It's a very uh, common type of compatibility testing issue or problem with browser-based applications. Um, now, it's also true, though, that you have to think of these test design techniques as, uh, as fundamentals, if you will. You know, the analogy that I've used over and over again is that, you know, you learn how to do things like uh, play a musical instrument or play a sport by practicing fundamentals. So, you know, if you're going to learn how to uh, play tennis, for example, you're going to probably at some point, if you want to be really good at it, you're going to get a one of those ball serving machines and you're going to set that thing up to fire balls at you and you're just going to practice your returns over and over and over and over again. Um, you're, if you're going to play uh, soccer or uh, football for people outside the